Welcome back to Elevator Inspiration for Sunday School. Hey, we are starting our total new series. Um, I'm calling this series a call series because each lesson is dealing with a call. We're going to be in the New Testament talking about a call to be heir. This is lesson one. So let's get started. First of all, when we think about a heritage, we ask the question, who am I? You know, because we want to actually focus on who my father, grandfather, great father, great grandfather, and on back in our lineage. So heritage connects people, not only to the past, for them to understand exactly who they are. So Matthew start off with his writing about Jesus' heritage. And then we're going to look at Hebrew and focus on how the heritage of Jesus is explained um, to the he in, in the book of Hebrew um, to the right. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we, we're going to be looking at two different writers today. All right. So Matthew writes his gospel as he focused on the current society. So look at it. Um, realize that when Jesus was here, uh, Herod had actually built the temple. So he has rebuilt the temple that Solomon had built uh, that was torn down by Nebuchadnezzar. So, but Herod was not a lineage of the Jewish. So he was not rightfully king, even though he's, he ruled over Judea. So Matthew wrote against this background. And look how Matthew starts out. He starts out by saying, this is the family tree of Jesus, David's son, Abraham's son. So he links it back. Now, I picked this particular scripture here, which is Matthew 1, 1 through 6 from the message. So I want you to look at verses 2 through 6. So let's spend some time on this. Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had Judah and his brothers. So that is where the 12 started. And then we focus on the tribe of Judah. And then we go down is where we're going to find Jesus. But what's interesting, when Matthew writes, he includes women in the lineage. This is so unlikely, but I think he does it for a purpose. I want you to look at the next verse. It says, Judas had Perez and Zeroth. Perez and Zeroth are twins. They came from Tamar. However, Tamar was not Judah's wife. Tamar was actually his daughter-in-law. Look at Genesis 38 chapter. Judas actually gave heir to Tamar, one of his sons. He did evil in the sight of God and God killed him. He told Adan, which is his second son, to go down to Tamar, um, take up the uh, your brother's lineage, have a child by her so we can keep the brother lineage alive. And what happened? Onan actually, spit, the scripture said he spilled his seed and that displeased God and God killed him. So Judas said, wait a minute now, my two sons are dead because of Tamar. However, he, he promised Tamar his third son, but he was not old enough. And when Tamar realized he was not going to give him his third son, what does Tamar do? She dressed up like a harlot um, and she actually... Um, have a relationship with Judah, and she bore these two kids here. They're actually twins, okay? Perez and Zera. Now, that's a really interesting story. I wish I had time to go more in detail with it, but go to Genesis 38th chapter. And then Perez had her, her Hezron. Hezron had Aram. Aram had Aminadab. And Aminadab had Nashon. And Nashon had Simon. And Simon had Boaz. Uh-oh. Here we go again. Another female. Boaz's mother was Rahab. You know who Rahab is? Yes. Rahab the harlot. We actually see her in, um, in the book of Joshua. In that book, Rahab hired the two spies. When they come into the city, she protects them. And look what happens. She actually is in the lineage of Christ. Boaz had Obed, Obed, and Obed mother was actually Ruth, a Moabite. So we have individuals in the Jewish lineage that are not actually Jews. And next we have um, David. Jesse had David. David became king. But I want you to notice he passed his lineage to Solomon. And who is Solomon's mother? Yes, Bathsheba. And notice the, how that story, I know you know that story. That is Uriah's wife, who David had killed because 
he had impregnated Bathsheba, who was another man's wife. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Matthew intentionally added individuals into Jesus' lineage, let you know that there is no one left out of his lineage from a standpoint that when Christ came, he is a king of all, not just of the Jews, but of all because everyone seemed like had a part, no matter how sinful your life is, you can go to him for salvation. All right, so let's move on. And then we have, of course, everyone knows Mary, who is the mother of Jesus. And then the, the 17th verse gives us um, uh, a number, which is 14. From Abraham to David are 14 generations from David until the carrying away in Babylon was 14 generations from the carrying away in Babylon to Christ is 14 generations. Now, uniqueness of 14, I think it's just more of a way to remember and to memorize the, his lineage. All right, so if we're going to dig deeper. This is the question that we want to start with. What guardrails can we erect to ensure that we do not misuse Bible genealogies? And we're going to focus on these scriptures here to look at that question a little bit more. And then what scripture memorization techniques do you find most helpful personally? And we'll look at those scriptures. All right, so now let's move to the second part of our lesson. Second part of our lesson is come from Hebrew. Now, the readers of Hebrew had Christian, are Christians now. However, they had a Jewish background. They believed in the Pentateuch, the law of Moses, and they also had the prophets. If you remember, go way back when Jesus was on earth at the transfiguration, we took Peter, James, and John with him. And at the transfiguration, who appeared? There was Moses that represented the law, and as Elijah that represented the prophets. And that we noticed that they wanted to build two. Peter wanted to build two tabernacles. And actually, there was a voice from heaven that said, no, um, hear my son. That is a key portion here in the scripture to understand this. Because if you look at this, it says, is one of the things that they question is, is Jesus as strong as angels? Because if you remember in the Old Testament, angels appeared oftentimes to help men. Um, they appear to Abraham. They appear to um, uh, Jacob. Um, so angels were throughout the scriptures. But for Jesus, what the rite of Hebrew is saying is that, yes, he is stronger. He is powerful enough to save. All right, so let's look at the scripture. Here we go. God, who at some dry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, has in the last days spoken to us by his son. Notice I highlighted his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, whom he also have made the worlds. So we're saying that Jesus actually made the world. So what that is telling me is that Jesus is God. And then notice the next verse, who being in brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made himself purge our sin. So here we have God comes incarnated in the flesh because only a perfect individual, a perfect being can pur purge our sin. And once he purged out of sin, notice where he is. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And then verse four unfolds. He being so much better than the angels, he hath by inheritance obtained an excellent name than they. And then the rite of Hebrew states, which of the angels has God said, thou art my son this day? Have I begotten thee again? I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That is showing the equalness of God the Father, God the Son. There is no second level 
there is totally equalness because not only that, the son actually made the world. Notice how John starts out, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Notice that he was there from the beginning, and he came down here on earth to be with us and to save us from our sins. Okay, so the question is, how will you respond to a fellow Christian who believes that Hebrew 1, 1 and 2, along with the passages such as in Colossians 2 and 14, implies that the Old Testament can be disregarded? Hmm. We're going to discuss that on Sunday. And then this next question I want you to think about, how can this tech help, text help you guard yourself against mistaken beliefs about angels? Then we can dig a little bit deeper by looking at 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and Colossians 2, 18 to add to that question. And then this question right here, I want you to really think on um, for the rest of the, even next week. Once you realize Jesus' absolute authority, how would that affect your service to him? Absolute authority. All right, so we're going to wrap it up. Here's, here's what I want as a wrap up. Matthew tell us about Jesus' human heritage as he is the promised king to bless our nation. And the right of Hebrew give us a comparison, but he focused on Jesus' divine heritage. Through these texts, the Holy Spirit directs us to pay attention to Jesus' message. He is God's son, greater than angels, our prophets. He is also God himself. Hey, just something we're going to look at it. We're going to rate how often you acknowledge your spiritual heritage in Jesus. Do you do it rarely or do you do it daily? And in what ways can you acknowledge your spiritual heritage more often? Hey, Jesus' words last. Okay. Hey, I appreciate you all joining me. I have a thought to remember is our future is in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We got our Zoom session. It's going to be tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. There's the meeting ID and the passcode. Remember the question now, how will Jesus' absolute authority affect your service to him? Hey, you all appreciate it. See you in Sunday School.